So um, as you know, Lorraine and I are going to present today on pain management. Um, just an overview of what we're going to cover, looking at the definition, a um, bit of patho, goals of pain management, the analgesia ladder, and then the most common analgesics that we use. So what is pain anyway? So the um, International Association for the Study of Pain say that pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. It causes physical discomfort that is accompanied by suffering, which is the emotional component of pain. Um, pain cannot be objectively measured. The only person who is the only person who knows about the pain is that person that's suffering, and that's why Margot McCaffrey, who is said to be the godmother of um, pain, she's a nurse, um, says that pain is what the person says it is and exists whenever he or she says it does. The American Pain Society goes further by stating that it is not the responsibility of clients to prove they are in pain, but it's the nurse's responsibility to believe them. Interesting statement. So looking at um, pathophysiology of pain, um, where it's deemed, um, it's called nociception. So it's the process of um, where information from the peripheral stimuli is transmitted through your primary afferent pain receptors. So that's just those nerves from the periphery going into the spinal cord and then into the brainstem, thalamus and cortex where we um, register the pain. And it's divided into different phases. So we have transduction, transmission, perception, and modulation. And we'll go through each of those. So transduction is just the phase from cellular injury to a neural signal. So that's when you hurt yourself, um, jam your finger in the door, and that cellular injury is turned into a nerve signal so the injured cells, that can be from thermal, so you know a burn or cold, um, mechanical, so that's what we normally think about with pain, um, pressure, swelling, um, tears, that sort of thing. And chemical, so that's your toxic substances or ischemia, like angina, that type of pain, um, or infection. So those um, injured cells release chemicals down um, listed there in the yellow box, and those chemicals excite the nociceptors, so those um, sensory nerve endings get excited by those chemicals and that causes an influx of sodium depolarizing that cell membrane and you've got an action potential and that's how the pain signal starts. So just looking at transduction, um, there's a couple of um, analgesics that we use that work right here on this first phase of pain relief. Can anyone um, tell me what they think it might be? Yep, local anaesthetic, perfect. So for those um, working in theatre, um, the local anaesthetic works here. So it stops the influx of sodium depolarizing the cell membrane. So you don't get the action potential and you don't get that transmission of that pain impulse. And the other one is um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So working on our prostaglandins, one of the chemicals that's released. So if we block those, then we're not gonna um, excite those nociceptors. So the next phase is transmission. The phase where stimuli moves from the peripheral nervous system towards the brain. So um, that, that pain impulse is carried from the periphery into the um, dorsal horn. And it's carried through A delta fibres or C fibres. So the A delta fibres are the small myelinated fibres. They are really rapid, fast um, impulses and they give you that sharp localised pain that um, again, so if you jam your finger in the door, you've got that intense, straightaway, localised pain. The C fibres are the larger ones, they're unmyelinated, so they work a lot slower. And when it starts throbbing a couple of hours later, that's that dull aching, those are your C fibres working. So there you've just got the A fibre is the green one, and the C fibre here is the blue coming into the dorsal horn from the periphery. So this is where you would have injured your finger and that impulse coming in. And it synapses here. So it's basically just passing that message on um, to the second neuron, so the next um, neuron going into the, up into the thalamus and the cortex. And so right here, um, 
it's like passing on the message or passing a baton. It does that through um, the use of neurotransmitters like substance P, glutamate and CGRP, which is a really long name I couldn't pronounce, so that was much easier. And um, it's another perfect place where we can manipulate it, use drugs to um, stop that pain impulse going through. Um, so we can either stop those neurotransmitters from being released there in the dorsal horn, or we can block the receptors on that second um, neuron and so that those neurotransmitters can't work. So opioid is a good example um, of blocking substance P right there. Now, so this um, is Lorimer Mosley, and he's a physiotherapist, but he is a pain specialist and a pain researcher. And I really, uh, I think his, um, his videos are really good explanations of pain. So basically, um, he was walking in the bush with a sarong on, and um, some, something touched him on the, um, on his left leg in the skin, and he just talks about how those A fibers quickly sent a message up to the brain, um, saying something dangerous has happened on the left side of your leg on the skin. And um, he's just really, really good at explaining it. And um, he carried on, went into the river for a swim, but it was actually a snake bite. And so he woke up hours later um, in intensive care and survived, obviously, um, this poisonous snake bite. And then a few months later, he was walking in the bush and he um, got, he felt a pain in the same spot. And so that message again was sent to his brain, but this time his brain was like, hang on a minute, we've been here before, and it was really bad, you almost died. So that's how the brain's looking at your experiences of pain and how it can influence the pain that you're feeling. And so he was in excruciating pain, of course, um, and he said he was on the ground and it was agony, and then one of his friends came and lifted up his pants to see what was going on, and he had a little scratch from a stick, and that's all it was. And it was just um, explaining about perception of pain. Once it does um, reach your thalamus and you, um, and how different things, different experiences, anxiety, all sorts of things can influence how people actually feel pain. So, um, what are the, some of the other things that you can think of that might alter people's perception of pain? I guess we see it a lot um, postoperatively, don't we? Um, so age, I mean we see um, younger people that experience that have, don't have a lot of experience of pain but are really sore after operations. We see older people who don't need as much pain relief. Um, culture, so you might get in um, the farmers that are quite tough and strong and they cope with the pain quite well. Um, anxiety, fatigue, those sorts of things that um, can, can decrease the pain threshold and really make people's pain experience um, heightened. Um, how much support they've got, the environment around them, and cognition. So this is where like sort of distraction comes in. If, they can, if you can be distracted, um, they might have visitors in visiting them for a while and they seem quite good and then when you go back in, they're really sore again. Um, so that's how that all influences um, their people's pain um, levels. And then the last phase is modulation. So this is where we can inhibit or suppress that transduction and transmission so that we can interrupt or diminish the percept perception of pain. So there's descending path pain pathways as well. So as well as those pathways that were going up, we've got ones coming down and they release neurotransmitters to block the transmission of those pain impulses. And we can also do things um, to um, block pain here as well. So non-steroidals, local anaesthetics, TENS um, and opioids. Um, so gate control theory, <laughs> we've probably all heard of, and that's, um, you know, when um, your child falls over and bumps their knee and you say, give it a rub, you'll be all right. Or, you know, you knock your elbow and, and you, you know, rub it to make it feel better. So this is, um, that's gait control theory in action. So experience of pain depends in part on whether the pain gets past a neurological gate in the spinal cord. So um, you've got the painful stimulus going through the A delta and C fibres that we talked about earlier. 
and they open the gate, although that looks more like a door, but that's our gate, and the transmission of pain um, occurs. But if you've got no, non-painful stimulus, so your A, beta fibres are working, so that's like when you're rubbing your you know, bumpy elbow and you give it a rub, that's what you're activating, that actually closes the gate, and so you won't get the transmission of pain. Um, so that's also um, good for, you know, when we use ice packs or heat, um, that's um, working on the gate control theory. So goals of pain management, obviously um, we want to improve quality of life for the patient, we want them to be more comfortable. Um, and that facilitates their recovery, gets them back to full function and reduces their morbidity. So they'll have um, fewer pulmonary and cardiac complications, um, you know, reduced DVTs if they can get up and move and be comfortable. Um, it allows them discharge from hospital and equally um, in PACU you know that you have extended lengths of stay for those patients that are sore. So if we can um, reduce their pain, we can get them um, onto the next part of their journey. It reduces hospital costs and um, it decreases chronic pain syndromes. So there's a lot of um, predictive factors for pain. Um, there's a few listed there. One of the, um, the systematic reviews I read recently was on preoperative predictive factors of postoperative pain in patients having hip and knee joint replacements. So they found um, the strongest um, associated factors were female gender, low socioeconomic status, a high level of pain preoperatively, comorbidities, low back pain, so a chronic um, low back pain, poor functional status, pre-op, and psychological factors, so the depression and anxiety. But it's quite good to know about these, especially um, for the, in the pre-assessment clinic, when we're um, seeing patients pre-operatively and educate, giving them the education on their surgeries. We can um, you know, talk to them about um, what to expect with their surgery. We can talk to them about um, what their expectation is of the pain, because they've nine times out of ten they've had stories or read something or looked at YouTube or Googled, um, and what how they think the pain medication is going to work, because um, a lot of people think that we've got all these wonderful drugs now, so you can give me those and I'm not going to have any pain. Um, so it's so it's the ability to give that realistic expectation and to relieve anxiety because um, as we know that will that can um, cause more pain. And obviously the anaesthetists when they see um, patients preoperatively uh, they're looking at um, their pain management plan. So what's the best plan for that patient, the spinal anaesthetic, the general anaesthetic, and postoperatively are they going to have a PCA, that sort of thing. And they also take into account, account their pre-existing chronic pain. Um, because as we know those patients can be quite hard to manage postoperatively as well. So the pain assessment, we all know this one is the most commonly used and accepted, our 10 point pain assessment. Um, but we also use um, an ob objective assessment of our patients when we're looking at their pain relief. So um, just their overall demeanour, we look at can they take a deep breath, can they cough, are they, are they able to do their exercises, um, and then we give our um, pain relief according to that, and then check in afterwards to see uh, how well that pain relief has worked. So the World Health Organization analgesia ladder was first um, used in palliative care but now is across the board for pain management and it's really um, simple and something we do every day here um, just starting with your simple analgesia on step one so paracetamol, um, non-steroidals and then as pain persists or is increasing adding in um, step two, like your codeine, your tramadol, and then for um, the moderate to severe pain, looking at the morphine and um, fentanyl, etc. So moving on to looking um, at our analgesia that we mainly use here, um, just keeping the back of the mind that 
one way or another, these medications are modifying that transduction, that transmission, the modulation of pain that we just talked about with the pathophysiology. So paracetamol, now step one. Um, interestingly, you know, it's most commonly used, you can buy it at the supermarket, but its mechanism of action is actually not completely understood still. So um, we know that it does inhibit um, cyclooxygenase COX in the central nervous system. Um, and it has no peripheral anti-inflammatory actions like non-steroidals do. And we don't give it to patients um, with any sort of um, liver disease, liver um, failure patients. But otherwise, it's pretty safe um, medication, hence why you can get it at the supermarket. Works pretty quickly, works in half an hour, um, peaks between one and three and lasts for about four. And just patients under 50 kgs are the ones that we just have to be careful with reducing the dose on those, um, even so for IV or per oral. So our non-steroidals, um, anti-inflammatories, so they work on cy cyclooxygenase as well. That's an enzyme which is responsible for formation of prostaglandins. And these prostaglandins cause inflammation, pain and fever. So if we can block those, we can decrease our pain, um, fevers and inflammation. So more commonly referred to COX-1 and COX-2. And here they all are, as you know. So we've got our non-selective non-steroidals. So they work on COX-1 and COX-2. And then our selective, which just work on COX-2, like our Salabrex and um, Dynastat, commonly given in theatre. So the COX-2s are associated with less gastrointestinal upset. Um, however, when patients are on Salabrex and aspirin, that's actually negated. So that's most of our patients um, in the ward that are taking um, a COX-2 inhibitor post-operatively. Um, a lot of them are on aspirin as well for that antiplatelet effect. Um, so they're not getting that gastro protection. So that's why they're also on amoprazole. So our um, anti-inflammatories, so COX-1 is um, continuously present in our stomach, um, in kidneys, endothelium, and platelets. It's part of our normal body function. So they're sort of termed protective prostaglandins. So, um, COX-2, however, is released um, during tissue injury, so from arachidonic acid. And COX-2 is our inflammatory prostaglandins. So we get pain because it, the nociceptors become, um, it makes them more sensitive. So those, the stimuli is going to work even, um, be increased. Um, fever, it resets our hypothalamus, um, our thermostat. So, increase, so we get a temperature and inflammation by um, increased blood flow to that area. Um, there's also a lot of talk around bone healing and whether um, non-steroidals affect bone healing. And that's why traditionally we haven't been giving them to our spinal fusions or patients with bone grafts. So they have proven in rats that um, if you give a COX-2 and they've got a fractured femur, a poor little rat, um, it will definitely decrease their healing. Um, and at the moment, the literature is sort of saying that for post-operatively um, short term, that the COX-2s are, um, are fine to be given. So one of the things that um, we always think about in the ward with our non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs is renal perfusion, especially in our elderly patients. So, um, the prostaglandins that normally are working in our kidneys, the, co the COX ones that are around in our bodies all the time, they work um, on vasodilating here so that we get a good blood flow to our glomerulus and we get a good um, glomerular filtration rate. But if you've given a non steroidal, and blocked that, then those prostaglandins aren't working to cause that vasodilation here and help um, maintain the blood flow to the kidney. So 
if you think about our patients that are quite often have low blood pressure after surgery anyway, so then therefore they've got a decreased blood flow to their kidney, and then we go and give them a non-steroidal, um, then, then their body isn't able to compensate like it normally would. And the elderly um, population um, can't compensate as well anyway. So that's um, a reason why if patients come in with some chronic renal impairment, we don't put them on non-steroidals. And if they've had a really low blood pressure, a sort of a consistently low blood pressure post-operatively, um, and they are elderly, we tend to hold that non-steroidal on the first day until we've got their blood results back and just check their kidney function before we go ahead and give it. So Celebrex, I just did Celebrex, I'm not gonna go through all of the non-steroidals. Works, um, peaks within about three hours and lasts for 11 hours. So some of the anaesthetists will chart it twice a day, like 100 milligrams twice a day, which is fine. Um, most of the time we, we're doing 200 milligrams once a day though. And now we're just gonna hand over to Lorraine. Cool. All right, so I'm going to talk about the rest of the analgesics that we use. Um, so tramadol um, comes on the step two of the World Health Organization pain ladder. It's essentially acting synthetic analgesic and it has two mechanisms of action. So the first one is that it binds at the same receptors as opioids. And the second is that it actually inhibits noradrenaline and serotonin reuptake. So I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, tramadol is also metabolised in the liver and it's broken down into about five different metabolites. And of note is the most significant one, which is known as M1 or O-desmethyltramadol. And it's quite a toxic metabolite. So it's present um, primarily in your, slow, in your quick acting um, tramadol in high quantities. And it's responsible for most of those side effects that we see like nausea, vomiting and basically intolerance of tramadol. So the tramadol, obviously we usually give um, 400 milligrams a day um, or up to 600 milligrams a day IV and that's um, irrespective of whether that's slow release or, um, or um, immediate release, that's in total. But for those aged over 74 years of age, the recommendation is that we reduce that dose to 300 milligrams and that's irrespective of whether that's um, per oral or IV. And of course we know the most common side effects are nausea and dizziness and often people just cannot tolerate tramadol. Um, the pharmacokinetics of tramadol, um, both slow release and quick acting will work within an hour. Um, but the difference in peak, so quick acting is between two to four hours with a duration of three to six hours. And then um, slow release tramadol, three to four hours and usually lasts up to around that 12 hour mark. Um, and it's interesting to note that slow release tramadol given twice a day is actually um, equivalent to giving 50 milligrams of quick acting QID. So I know that we give both, but we're actually giving quite a lot of um, quick acting on top of the slow release. So it is recommended that slow release tramadol be started first. It does have less of the toxic metabolites, so it generally is more readily um, tolerated compared to giving high doses of the quick acting. So now you hear a lot of don't give the slow release because if they don't tolerate it, it's in their system longer. And yes, it's correct, but they're actually getting less of that toxic metabolite, so they generally can tolerate it for a lot better than the quick acting tramadols. So as tramadol inhibits the reuptake of um, noradrenaline and serotonin, combination therapy with um, serotonergic um, agents, so that's like your citalopram's, your fluoxetine, venaflaxines, as well as your tricyclic antidepressants, say amitriptyline and nortriptyline, um, you have an increased risk of um, serotonin syndrome. So as you can see on the picture here, the way they work, and tramadol works exactly the same, is these are the two synapses between um, the nerves and these little blue things here is the drug inhibiting the serotonin being taken up by the next nerve. So we have all this serotonin just floating around in our um, bloodstream and with antidepressants that's good because that actually alleviates depression, makes you feel happy. Um, but if we combine that therapy with tramadol we have excessive serotonin just floating around in our system and so that's when we can run into serious problems. 
So with that excess serotonin we can have symptoms that range from anything um, from headache to confusion right through to um, seizures, coma and also death. And it can happen within minutes, hours and months of these combination of medications. So while it's rare, it, is happen, it can happen, um, it does happen and it's just something to be wary of because a lot of our patients do go on both of those medications. It's usually on tramadol for sort of really short courses so that the risk um, theoretically is deemed to be less but it can happen. It can happen with just one dose of tramadol in relation to their um, antidepressant medication so something to be wary of. The next step of um, pain relief is your opioids. So they come up on the third step of the World Health Organization. And they have specific um, binding sites. And they were first reported in 1973 um, and known as the Delta, the Kappa, and the Mu receptors. They're located in the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, like Kirsty mentioned before. And an example is the peripheral nervous system, you know, um, the, in the wall of the gut and responsible for that power, powerful constipating effects that we see with opioids. So we activate these receptors and we get a response and we get anything from analgesia through to sedation, pupil constriction, respiratory depression, right through to that horrible um, constipation that we often see on the ward. So as you can see here and what Kirsty described earlier, um, we have trauma. So this is anything from your surgery to hurting your finger, it's down at the peripheries and it's also where your local anaesthetics work. And basically what happens is that trauma stimulates the pain impulse to the dorsal horn and this is again where your opioids work. So they're blocking the release of those substances P and glutamate and therefore it inhibits the, tra um, inhibits the transmission of that pain impulse up to the brain which they're where it's in, um, subsequently interpreted as pain. So morphine, we have morphine sulfate, Sevridol and Amezlon. So they work um, primarily at the mu opioid receptors um, with minimal activity at other opioid receptors. The availability is 20 to 40 percent which is quite interesting. So we give 10 milligrams of an opioid, morphine, and only two to four milligrams actually reaches the systemic circulation so it's actually quite a small amount and that's because it's um, quite extensively metabolised and and because when it's metabolised into meta um, metabolites it has an active metabolites which is then excreted renally so for those people that have renal impairment they have an increase in that um, toxic metabolite in their system which is then why they have um, adverse effects so we need to dose adjust those for renal impairment. Oxycodone, um, an alternative to morphine, works in the same way but it's really good for those who can't tolerate morphine. Um, there's good and bad things here, the availability is 80%. So we give 10 milligrams, we're getting 8 milligrams reaching the systemic circulation. So while that's really good, it has a really high dependence and addiction rate in the um, primary health care circles, so we don't generally like to give it to patients long term or discharge them home for sort of anything longer than sort of three to five days. The other good thing about oxycodone is that it has very few active metabolites, so it's really, really safe in renal impairment, um, so we don't really have to adjust the dose too much, but we do have to be aware that with a slow release formation, it is different to your meslon morphine, and that it has a quick acting release, so they don't need to be given together. So you don't need to give your oxycontin with your oxynorm, you only need to be giving your oxycontin. And because of the availability of oxycodone, it's twice of morphine. So when you're changing over from say morphine to an oxycontin, you need to adjust the dose and titrate it dependent on the pain. Fentanyl, um, it works the same as your other um, opioids, um, but it has a high potency, but quite a short um, length of action. We use a lot of um, patches post-operatively, um, and with the patches, the only downside is that it has a really slow onset. So even though IV has a quick onset, the patches don't really have shown effect for sort of 12, even up to 24 hours after they've been applied. 
but when they're removed they can also continue to um, provide analgesia for up to 17-20 hours post removal of that patch and that's simply because it works by putting the medication in the upper layers of the skin and then it's slowly absorbed into the system. There are no active metabolites with um, fentanyl, so again, safe with renal impairment, um, but with the older adult, they are still susceptible to those um, adverse effects, so again, we need to be careful with them. The thing to be aware of as well with fentanyl patches, um, as you can see here, we can give, as we go down, you, so 10 milligrams of Severidol 4 hourly is equivalent to 60 milligrams of Imeslon over 24 hours which is again equivalent to your five milligrams of Oxynorm, four hourly, or 10 Oxycontin TDS, or 30 milligrams in 24 hours, and that's your 12.5 milligrams of fentanyl. So if you think of your 12.5 of fentanyl in 24 hours being equivalent to giving Oxycontin TDS, you can see why we don't want them given together, or why it's not recommended that the slow releases are given in um, combination with those patches. We often do give the quick acting, um, and usually in that first 24 hours is when they need most of the doses um, because they've obviously come off a PCA or their um, intrathecal's worn off and they go into a patch but they've got a sort of 24 hours before they get a real good impact from that patch. And we're often um, halving the dose when they go home and so if they're on a 25 we're sending them home with a 12.5 patch for the next three days just to tide them over. So naloxone, as we all know, it's great, it works wonders. It's an opioid antagonist. It has a higher affinity to the opioid receptors. It doesn't activate the receptors, but it blocks them so that the opioids can't attach onto them. So that's how it effectively knocks them out of the way so we get that reversal of the um, opioids. Gabapentin, favourite gabapentin. It's an antileptic drug. It's used in epilepsy as well as neuropathic pain. Um, lots of research around its um, use in post-hepatic neuralgia as well as painful diabetic neuropathy and phantom limb pain. And more recently um, it's been um, proven to be effective for acute post-operative pain and also in some situations um, works well with chronic regional pain syndrome. Um, as with paracetamol, we don't really know how gabapentin works. Um, it's thought that um, it has a calming effect on the nerves um, in the dorsal horn, inhibiting those pain response because neuropathic pain is thought to be caused by oversensitisation of those, um, all the nerves in the dorsal horn. So we block them, we get an um, inhibition of that pain impulse up. So here's an example of the picture. So as you can see here, this is our gabapentin here. So we get the, um, down here we have the injury, follows down to the dorsal horn and we can block the dorsal horn here by inhibiting the impulses for moving further up to the brain to stop them being um, interpreted. So it does work in the same place as um, opioids, um, just in a different, different mechanism. Um, one in five people react to gabapentin. It's one of those ones that we're constantly having to either titrate or stop, um, but by titrating and uh, managing the dose, most patients will be okay on low dose. Because um, often it's prescribed 300 milligrams three times a day, we're often titrating that back and um, depending on the patient, usually 100 milligrams. Or um, they use, often at public, they're using, is it 200 BD? Or 300 BD rather than a TDS um, dose. I think 200 BD and 100 BD for Yeah, so 200 BD and 100 BD for elderly. Um, so we are starting to see some of the um, some of the different ways of it being prescribed on the ward, but it is frequently the one that we are altering probably the most in terms of um, tolerance. Um, discharge time on gabapentin? No, not not generally. Um, there's a high risk associated with obviously dizziness and uh, drowsiness, and so falls. 20% um, of people that go home um, over the age of 60 on gabapentin associated with high falls coming back with necophema fractures and all sorts so we generally don't. Um, a lot of the breast patients go home on gabapentin but in terms of the arthroplasty patients we're generally not sending them home and unfortunately it's not subsidised either so it's a bit of a, bit of a bummer. Um, onset usually within 45 to 60 minutes peaks at around that sort of three hour mark and usually lasts a sort of five to seven hours. So um, 
yeah, BD dose, you're not getting a full cover over that 12 hours, but you're still getting a decent, decent, um, decent wham of it. For paracetamol? So the question is with um, children who are 55 kilos, do we still give? It, it, very, it does very depend because yes, they're 55 kilos, but often depending on their age, they're not actually, their organs are not maturely developed. So you do need to take that into consideration as well. So generally, no, I won't. I would usually do it based on their age as well and take all the factors into consideration. Yep.